Good morning. My name is Irvin Rodriguez. For those who still don't know me, I'm the community outreach minister here at BCC. Um, in the past, I've been, I've had the privilege to preach for you guys, and I've preached about worship, and I've preached about hardships. And today I want to take a step back even further <laughs> and uh, go with the scripture, uh, dissect the scripture that I've mentioned over and over again in a, a few of these sermons. And uh, it it's centers on discipleship. In fact, if you look it up, it's Luke 14. Uh, if you look it up, most of the Bibles, the title on that scripture is going to say the cost of discipleship. It's a reoccurring subject that uh, has come up in my Bible classes, in my Bible studies, and as well as my K group. Uh, in fact, it was supposed to take only uh, one or two Sundays about discipleship in our K group, but it seems like every Sunday it comes up in, in, in conversation and we, we still talk about it even today. So uh, let's start with the just the first verse of today's scripture. That's Luke 14, verse 25. And it says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said. That's just the first verse. Uh, at the beginning of this portion, we read that there was a large crowd, a, a multitude of people that were traveling with Jesus. Uh, by this point, they had probably already heard of his teachings. They had probably already heard about his miracles. So by this point, a crowd had gone together. They had heard about how he taught about repentance, about how to be humble, about helping the outcast, something that people didn't do back then. So... They just wanted to follow him to see what, what the deal was. With all these teachings, the crowd had joined in and were traveling with Christ. And as I read this portion of, of scripture, I, I, I just stop and wonder what happened from this point to Luke 22 that there was only 12 disciples, 12 followers on the last day that Christ was with us. What was the reason that there wasn't a crowd with him on that day? What made this crowd just turn to 12 people? Many factors came into place. I'm positive of that. But I'm also confident that this teaching, these words that Christ said, also was one of the main reasons a lot of people decided, this is not for me. Let's read the next portion, which is the, the meaty part of Scripture today. That's the main part today. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This was the cost, the requirement Jesus gave this crowd. To whoever wanted to be his disciple, a, a price that I believe most of them could not pay or were not willing to pay. I want to first focus on the word hate because it jumps out of scripture for a lot of people. And, and, and if you were me, when you first read this, you wonder, wait, isn't this the same guy that said, love thy neighbor? So why is they now hate mother, father, sister, brother? Is it the same guy or, or, or not? So I did some studying and, and, and I knew from the beginning that the word hate wasn't particularly how our culture knows hate. And uh, I, I got a a commentary by Craig Keener, it, it says this in this portion of, of scripture. It says, hate, the word hate, could function as a hyperbolic, semantic way of saying love less. But this point hardly diminishes the offensiveness of this saying in a society where honor of parents was considered virtually the highest obligation and one's family was usually one's greatest joys. Teachers regularly demanded great respect and affection, but in Jewish tradition, only God demanded such a wholesale devotion as Jesus claims here. Two points. One point, which I've already started with, is the word hate means to love less. Don't put your family, don't put your kids, don't put yourself above God. This is what the commentary is saying. The second point was that in those days, a Jewish teacher would never, never say this to a crowd. Why? Because by saying, you have to love me more than your family, more than your parents, yet they were putting themselves at the level of God. So in a hidden message, Christ was saying who he was in this portion of scripture. And sometimes we just read over it and don't think much about it. The second part 
hate your family, put your family second. Second part, put yourself second. This is the part that I think a lot of people struggle with. And, and I'll explain why. Yes, there is that one side of people that respect highly their parents and, and, and their siblings and their spouses. And, and really, when it comes to a decision, when it comes to something that they have to do, instead of praying, instead of going to the word first, they first call their mom, they first call their spouse, they first call their children, hey, I'm struggling with this, can you help me? And sometimes the answer they receive is not the right answer. And they put God second. And sometimes they go through what they were going through, and years later they read an inscription and say, man, if I would have only read scripture when this was going on in my life, this is what I've had dragged for years. Why? God is not first. Who was first? The person that they gave them that instructions to do with their lives. But then there's another group. There's another group that maybe uh, their parents, maybe their siblings, maybe they were an only child, maybe it's just their family was broken and they have no respect for them. They, it's not really hard to put God above them. Really? So... Then, there, it's more difficult for them when it says, put yourself second. Put your plans, put your decisions, put your goals second to God. We all have goals, right? Now, this teaching came to us even before Christ walked with us. It's not something new. It's not something Christ first taught. It wasn't nothing new. In fact, Abraham was asked to give up who? His son. Family. God said, put your son second, put me first. I tell you to kill him. Do it. Luckily, God stopped him in the moment, and God said, now I've seen how much you love me. Then later on, we, we read in the Old Testament about Moses, right? If you know Moses, Moses was essentially adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter, right? And, and he had this wonderful life, because he lived with the Pharaoh. It's this wonderful life, comfortable life. Yet God came to him and said, free my people. Leave this life of comfort and free my people. So then Moses didn't say, no, God, you know, I'm comfortable here. I like my house here. He didn't say that. He followed the instructions. He followed God's plan, not his plan. I'm sure he had better plans for his life. I'm sure he had plans of staying there and becoming Pharaoh one day. But plans changed. He had to move out. He freed the people from Egypt. And then God gave them the Ten Commandments, found in Exodus 20. God gave them these Ten Commandments, and the first commandment, found in verse 3, says, You should have no other gods before me. Then in verse 4 continues, You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. God wants to be number one. He doesn't want to be second. He doesn't want to be third. And I'm sure he doesn't want to be last. Uh, later on in this chapter in Exodus, uh, in fact, yes, one of the commandments is respect and honor thy parents. But notice what the first commandment is. First commandment is, you should have no other gods before me. Me, God, not me. So God is saying, yes, you have to respect your parents. Yes, you have to honor your parents. Yes, you have to love thy neighbor. But I'm first. If I tell you to do something, you do. In the past few months, we, like I said before, we had an opportunity to have our first successful K group this semester and uh, we were teaching about discipleship and uh, we talked a little bit one day about the difference between a disciple and a member. Um, first, we came to the conclusion, yes, a disciple and a member should be the same thing. If you're a member of a church, you should be a disciple. And if you're a disciple, then you should be a member of a church. Yet the society, this world, the church as a whole has separated those two things. And I'll explain why. A, a, a typical member comes to a Sunday for his weekly Bible study, while a disciple comes to study for his last Bible study of the week. A member waits to be taught, while a disciple goes to the Word. He jumps into the Word and studies it. A member needs support, needs someone to lean on, while a disciple offers the support to others. 
young Christians, non-believers. A member waits to be visited while a disciple visits others. A disciple is never embarrassed of the gospel, no matter the place, the time, the company, or any other factor that comes into mind. No matter what, he's not afraid to share the gospel at his workplace, in the park, anywhere. So I have concluded with this. A member runs to heaven to save his seat there, while a disciple will slow down, will walk, will even crawl to heaven just to get another person to heaven. What did God call us to do? Did God call us to run to heaven, to make members only, or did he call us to make disciples? The Great Commission answers this question. In Matthew 28, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Two things. What is a disciple? Luke 14 tells us what the cost of a disciple is. We're supposed to make disciples, not members. Second thing is, if, if, if you're wondering, maybe this is not for us, well, at the end of this says, and he, he refrains to saying, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. So everything that involves all his teachings, that includes Luke 14, just in case you want to find a loophole. So God calls us to make disciples, not members. And for those uh, who, who, who still doubt, I, I, I encourage you to go into the scripture yourself. Be a disciple and, and go into the scripture yourself this week and, and, and just read about it. So, so can you imagine what Christ was doing, what Christ was doing with this crowd, this multitude of people that he had gathered from his teachings, when he turned around and said these things? You know, he could have easily talked about something that made him a little bit more happier, right? He probably could have said something that would have made him give money to their ministry, maybe something that would have made them go back to their homes and bring another person the next Sunday. Uh, maybe he could have preached something that was sweet to their ears. Uh, but at the end of the day, the crowd was there for his teachings. They wanted to be his followers. And Christ turned around and explained to them what the cost of being his follower was really. In verse 27, we already saw it. It says in great description, Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So the scripture gives us two things. One thing, deny your family, deny everyone, deny yourself. Second thing, carry your cross. Carry your own cross. Many of us have been sweet talked about Christianity. And I'm not going to lie, I've been one of them. I, I, I've done the error, and, and sometimes I, I catch myself and I correct it. And sometimes it's just been so long and I'm corrected. But... We've been sweet-talked by someone, our family, our, our pastors, our teachers, that Christianity is all fun and games. If you come here, then we're going to give you a free donut, we're going to give you a free book, and you're going to be wealthy, and it doesn't matter, whatever you ask to God, you want a job, I'll give you a job. You, you want a, a car, I'll give you a car. You want a house, I'll give you two houses. We've been taught that. And sometimes we're not even taught that, but we come to that conclusion. Ask whatever we want, and God will give it to me. We've made God into a genie in a bottle. These are sweet talks that, that we receive, not outside of the church, inside the church. Yet Christ described discipleship like carrying your own cross. The church as a whole, not, not just our church, but as a whole, must mimic this teaching with everything. What we say, what we do, even when we decide. Is this something God wants? God never said it is going to be easy. He never did. He gave us a goal. Once we die, once we go to heaven, that's going to be easy, maybe. But in this world, it's not going to be easy. So we have to mimic this of what Christ is teaching us here. Remember, when Christ ascended, he left 11 disciples. One had already died, Judas. Just 11 disciples and other people that followed them, like the Marys and other people. But from them, they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. They had 500, they had 2,000, 5,000 multiplied. So much that today, we can sit here in this church, I can stand in this pulpit, and talk about the Word of God across the entire world from where Jesus was. So what was this passion they had? 
after the disciples, Paul came. Paul had the same passion. Paul had a passion that no matter the insults, no matter if someone made fun of him, no matter the people that bickered at him, no matter how many times he was attacked, no matter how many times he was stoned, no matter if he was hungry or to the point of dying, he never stopped preaching the word. We're talking about Paul, the guy that used to kill Christians. Do we have this passion as a church? I believe we don't. I believe we have allowed ourselves, uh, me included, to create more members in the church than disciples. And when that happens, and it has happened, the church is vulnerable. It so easily can fall apart. And you say, well, I don't think so. Consider this. People that have left churches, for what reasons? Was it the word of God that they left the church? Not really. Maybe the preacher was too charismatic, or maybe the preacher was not charismatic enough. Maybe the preacher was too old, or the preacher was too young. Maybe the music sucked. Maybe the, the musicians were too loud. Maybe the musicians were not loud enough. Maybe they didn't serve the donuts I wanted. Maybe the teachers they had didn't teach what I wanted to hear. Maybe how they treated certain things in the church was not good. They didn't have enough ministries. They didn't have enough leaders. They had too many leaders. There's a lot of excuses why people will leave churches. And I tell you, probably the last place is the word of God. And this is why. We have created a church, a church as a whole, the entire world, that caters comfort. That's our number one catering thing, comfort. Something that God can provide that can give us in our mind, peace of mind. Never says you're going to be comfortable physically. He says, I'll give you peace of mind, peace in your heart. And when you get here with me in heaven, then you'll be comfortable. But he never said it was going to be comfortable here in this world. He said it was going to be difficult, so much that we would have to imagine ourselves carrying a cross. So we've created this church that wants comfort. If we're not comfortable, then we can go to another church. And that's okay, because guess what? The church as a whole has created a church for almost anything. Do you want a church that's all Hispanics? You can go to one church like that. Do you want a church that has all white people? You can go to a church like that. Do you want a church that has all African Americans? They're a church like that. Do you want a charismatic pastor? They're a church like that. Do you want a church that lasts five hours? They're a church like that. Do you want a church that lasts 50 minutes? There's a church like that. Do you want a church where it's only college students? The church like that. You want a church where it's all people who are 60 and up? There's a church like that. Because guess what? So many churches, you can just leave and go to the one that pleases you, that makes you comfortable. So God doesn't want us first. He doesn't want even our comfort to be first. He wants his plans, his goals to be first. That's what he's telling us here. And the thing is, this comfort that we've created, it really is my way or the highway. I won't come here. That's okay. You'll lose money. I'll just go to a different church. That'll give you the comfort that I want. And that's because sometimes we see like the church just wants the money. It's not what we want. God says, if you want to follow me, give up your decisions, give up your parents' decisions, give up everything, and carry your cross. The scripture then continues, giving us three examples, find, uh, found, sorry, in verses 28 and on. Uh, the first example is in verse 28. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. That's the first example. Second example he gives, the next verse, says, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have uh, cannot be my disciples. And then lastly, the last example, uh, which is my favorite, is verse 34. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. 
first point is the last point there. I think everyone in this room has ears. So this message was not just to them, but to all of us. Three examples. The first one is pretty simple. You want to build a building. You want to build a tower. Let's put our new building as an example. Imagine if we have never met to, to discuss the cost of how much it would cost to build a new building. Imagine that. Imagine if someone would be like, okay, I have my hammer, let's start taking balls down, and then we'll start building from there. Probably would have been left with just a foundation also. And the neighborhood would have been thinking, man, it's been two years and they haven't built a church yet? What's wrong with this church? Right? Luckily, we had a good group. They planned before. They count the cost, and now we have a nice new building. The second example that we get is about war. To put, the, put this example in head, imagine you're a soldier. You're going to war. You get there with, with your commander, and you said, sir, I'm ready to go to war. Are you sure you're ready? I'm sure. He asks you again, are you sure you're ready? I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm ready. Send me. And he sends you. You come back. You're crying. Well, I didn't expect them to have weapons. I, I didn't expect for me to have to fight. I didn't expect them to be so mean to me. If you're going to war, count the cost. You know they're going to be mean. You know they're going to fight back. Count the cost. Same way we're sent to war spiritually, a lot of us come back thinking, man, this is not for me. Third example, like I said, it's the one I favor the most. And salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. So salt was a very resourceful resource, and uh, it was used to flavor food like we do nowadays, but it was also to preserve food, which we still do, but we don't know about it. Um, and then the other part uh, was if they had manure, they would put salt on top, and they would mix it with soil, and that would make the plants grow better and, and, and faster. So... So God is saying, he's asking them, you wouldn't keep a pile of salt that's lost the main reason to be salt, right? And I have a question, and I probably a question a lot of them asked, why would you want a big pile of salt that has no flavor? And I have an answer. I think the answer is pretty simple. The churches, the church, likes to look at the world and say, look at my big pile. Look at all the salt I have. Look at all the people that come to my church. But what meaning is it if we have a pile of salt that is worth nothing? He says it's not even worth for the manure. I hope you know what, what, what manure is. That, that, that's poop. Okay? <laughs> He's putting it down there. You don't even work for that. <laughs> okay? The church has turned their back. They said, no, you know what? If he's a member, at least he's coming, at least he's contributing, you know, at least he's here. Oh, well, maybe one day he'll be a disciple, maybe not. Oh, well. We've chose that. We just let it go. Like I said before, and I, I, I probably forgot to mention it in, in this sermon, this scripture is very convicting. And if you're sitting right now in the church and don't feel convicted, I, I ask you to reread it when you go back home. Because the reason this, this scripture is very convicting and should be convicted to everyone is because we all fail. We all fail. Our sins are created because we place someone above God. I did things because what? I wasn't pleasing God. I was pleasing myself. I did things that I didn't agree with. Why? Because I wasn't pleasing God. But, hey, my wife was pleased. My daughter was pleased. She was laughing. So if you have committed a sin, this scripture should be convicting. Now, I want to reassure you guys, and I want to correct if you misunderstood about salvation. In Ephesians 2, verse 8, Paul writes this to the church. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, if you thought salvation and discipleship is the same thing, it's not. So, so, so Luke, or really Jesus, because he's the one that said it, and Paul are not contradicting itself, themselves. 
Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you all. We need to understand these teachings, and they come together. This past Wednesday, uh, I chose it to be my sermon day, which is the day I studied and I wrote the sermon. And I came to this part, and I, decided, and, and I prayed to God, what should I put in this part of the sermon? I wanted to share an example of my life. And two things came to, to mind. I wanted to explain the hardships of life. Carry your own cross. God never said it was going to be easy. So there's two things that I came to mind. One, for those who didn't know, uh, I, I used to live in a small room, probably the size of Mike's office, with, with all my family, five members. We used to live there we, until I was about 14 years old. And uh, we had a, a triple bunk bed, which was not really certified, but that's okay. And, and we, have, we, we had a full-size bed for my parents. And we all slept there. All of our clothes were, were in there. And then the rest uh, was a shop, was a shared pair shop. And, and a cleaners. So the reason I can sleep anywhere is because my dad would work at two in the morning and we had machines in our ears at all times. So that's part, part of what I was wanting to share. The second part was my house burning down. I, and I, I mentioned this before already, for those who don't know, uh, about a year or a little bit more than a year ago, I lost basically all my belongings and in, in, in my house burning down. And, and, and while I was praying, something just felt off. And, and, and this, is, this is what I came to my conclusion was, even though I was raised in that condition, I never felt poor. I, I, I never felt like I was missing out from something. I mean, I knew friends that were in worse conditions. Uh, some of my family members from, from, from my cousins and aunts lived in worse conditions. So I didn't feel poor. I, didn't, I had a happy life when I was a kid. I, I didn't pity myself, and I don't think anyone should. And then the other part was, yes, the initial shock of losing my home was, was, was big, but when Ryan and Trey came to our aid and, and just hugged us, and, and then a lot of people else came to us afterwards, and then the Sunday after that, we had the church's love upon us, it was so hard just to really feel pain after that. When you have that immense love in there. So yeah, even though maybe it wasn't fair, I, I didn't even feel pain. So I went home, I prayed, and, and when I came back from choir, um, I'm taking down my daughter, and we're getting ready to bed, and, and I get a text from my mom, and uh, of course it was in Spanish, but this is what it said in English. Uh, Your cousin Angel was shot in the head and on the back. Please pray, period. Uh, Angel and his family are particularly close to my family. When I was young, uh, about eight years old, my dad decided to make a band out of our, uh, our siblings, me, and then my two cousins, uh, Ankle and Kike, his brother. And so we were raised together. We had a lot of days that we would just spend hours trying to learn instruments, and we would play together because he would stay over so much. So we were raised with him. And um, he, he, was my sis he, he, he was my sister's age. He's about five years older than me. But uh, he's still real close to me. And uh, so it was very heartbreaking when I got this, this text. Uh, Angel was going to get married in about two weeks, and uh, obviously that's not going to happen. And, and in fact, on Sunday of last week, my mom spoke to him, and if you know Angel, he's he's just a light. Uh, he just and Angel means angel in Spanish. For those who are wondering, uh, he spoke to my mom, and he was, he was so happy, and he's like, "I'm so sorry that I'm inviting you so late, but I'm getting married with my wife, and, I, and I'm ready to start my life, and I'm ready to have a kid." And I just, I'm just ready to start this. And, and then he said, oh, man, I'm so jealous that Irvin, the youngest of us five, he's the first that, that got married and the first one that had a kid. You know, he, he was a bit jealous about that. And, and my mom just talked to him, and they were so happy just talking to each other, and him sharing all his plans and goals that he had. And then three days later, this happened to him. He was coming out of uh, the shop that he works in, uh, there in Mexico, in Reynosa, uh, and this is two steps away from Texas, guys. So this is not across the world, this is not deep South America, two steps away from Texas. He was coming out, and uh, his coworkers were leaving, and he, he was closing. The road was closed by two cartels. They had a problem with each other, and they started a shootout against each other. Six civilians were killed that day, and one was heavily injured. My cousin was the one that was heavily injured and is now laying in the bed. 
My cousin is a Christian. My cousin believes in God. My cousin decided to be a disciple. If you knew him, he has such a heart for God. And now instead of fighting for Christ, now he's trying to fight for his life. One bullet went from his nose to his ear, and two others went in his back and came out from the front. And for some miracle, those two bullets missed every internal organ, which is weird, don't you think? But if you consider this guy, this guy who, who really had a great passion for Christ, who in that city, it's so hard not to be involved with the cartels. So hard. They'll kill you if you say no. So hard. Yet he decided not to be involved in crime. He decided to be a good person. He wanted to get married. He wants a baby. And now he's fighting for his life. How is this Christianity? To a lot of us, you'll be heartbroken be, and probably consider God is not real. But if you consider Luke 14, Luke 14 says, carry your cross. He never said it would be easy. I imagine Christ turning around to this group and looking at the group of people, the crowd that was gathered. And, and, and remember, he was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. So he turned around, Christ looked at his crowd, and he, he was probably thinking, wait a minute. There's one too many in this group. So then he told them what a disciple was. Are you sure you belong in this group? Are you sure you want to be a follower of Christ? Because if you are, you might get insulted. You might get stoned. They're going to hate you like they hate me. They're going to persecute you like they persecute you, how they persecuted me. And, and guess what? They might shoot at you like they shot my cousin. But if you do want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. Many of them and many of us rejected the idea and said no. And some of us have decided to just be members, not disciples. Yet Christ still died for us. Can you imagine that? Out of the 12 that were left, one would betray him, the other would deny him, and the rest would scatter from fear. And he knew this, and yet he still died for us. He knew that 2,000 years later, we were going to be alive and deny him day by day and create churches that didn't care much for the word, but more for the comfort of the people, and he still died for us. I think that's why it's written in Romans 5. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. For who? For everyone. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, cried, Christ died for us. We're all sinners. The scriptures must be convicting for everyone. It convicts me every day. Sometimes I like to ignore it. I want an easy life. But God tells us to be a disciple. We need to follow these instructions. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I pray that you pray to count the cost. Count the cost of being a disciple. Don't do it because it's fun. Don't do it because you want to get wet. Don't do it because you want the attention of everyone clapping for you when you get baptized. Don't do it because all your friends and all your family are doing it, and might as well. Count the cost. God wants a full commitment, not partial, not half, not five-eighths, whatever fraction you want to make up. If you're wanting to accept the Lord today, I pray, and I hope the church prays with you, to count the cost. Remember, salvation is free. Christ died already for us. Our sins have been paid. Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you all. Let's stand up and sing this song of invitation.